Access Live with Kevin Rankin. Thank you so much for being here, folks. You are seeing this delayed video because I'm out on a boat somewhere cruising through the Caribbean, rocking with a block of seagulls. So let me tell you that before I get started with my guests, I have to thank these sponsors. And if you're watching this on anything else other than YouTube, I would love it. If you see the link below, go to youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin. You'll see a subscribe button there. Please hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button if you like this video, and then the bell so you'll be notified about all of my upcoming guests. You can go back through and look at over 240 other episodes with amazing guests. None other, than, uh, no more amazing than today's, but uh, I do have some sponsors that have helped make this happen. So let me thank first my buddies at Five Star Guitars. Five Star is based in Beaverton, Oregon, which means that if you are interested in buying guitars outside of Oregon, you're going to save by, by paying no sales tax. So if you go to the link below, 5starguitars.com slash live and use the promo code of allaccess15, you're going to save 15% off. You're going to pay no sales tax. And then if you're interested in playing drums, you can go right over to the greatest drum shop on the West Coast, Rhythm Traders. They've been around for 30 years. They do repairs. They do lessons. And they have great selection of cymbals and drums. And if you go in and you let them know that you came here via all access live you'll get 10 percent off as well since they're in oregon there's no sales tax so i'm saving you a ton of dough if you feel like sending some dough back this way and you want to help support the production of the show you can go to venmo at kevy metal and send anything you think that might help out with the production get uh maybe some airfare for some of my guests so they could be sitting beside me or maybe on that cruise ship and we could do it in person the greatest music store uh, selling vinyl and uh, the music that you'd love to purchase that has been produced by my next guest is Music Millennium. Another one based here in Oregon. If you go to musicmillennium.com, they have been around since the 70s. Uh, probably the best selection of vinyl that I've seen. And I do a lot of traveling and hitting music stores, record stores. So uh, go to Music Millennium and order all sorts of music. And then you'll find out that half of those records have probably been produced by my next guest. You've seen him in so many different environments, but most recently in December, he released a project that had originally been recorded as a song with uh, Max Webster and Rush back in 1980, I believe. And, uh, and now he's reimagined that song with an incredible video uh, called Battle Scar. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that and all of the great things that he's done. He's also an amazing drummer. So right here, I've got from the studio, Tom Gordon. How you doing, sir? Greetings. How are you? Did I get that right? All of it? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, you gave me a, gave me a little too much credit for albums that have you know been released. I've done several that people have bought, but not half of them. But yeah, you know, okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Good looking out. What's a record that's been released that you wished? Oh man, I would love to have been the guy behind that. Um, Rush Moving Pictures. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> man. Can't you set your sight your sights a little? Yeah, low? Like, oh, yeah that's kind of been the the litmus point. Is like when I because that's the album I devoured as a kid, and yeah. you know when I when I make a record that some kid now will devour the way I devoured Moving Pictures, then then I'm good. God, man. Uh, I got close with a couple, but uh, they they were in the okay. kind of the hardcore genre that never blew up the way Moving Pictures blew up. Tell me it, the ones that you feel like were kind of uh, close, you know. So you mean it, as far as like maybe the energy or the vibe that you got from the songs, or the, no, the the way it impacted the fan base. Okay, uh, the the fans of this group worship this record. The, the it was a Reno hardcore band called Fall Silent, and it was an album called Superstructure. Okay, and and so many people cite that now as a as one of their Holy Grail albums. You know, members of Nile even say, "Oh, oh wow, right. Fall I'm Silent." superstructure that record oh my god no kidding all right yeah yeah but, um it, man you've done it across the board i mean you've got records like uh, you worked on the chronic dre's record yep. right and uh um i know that you've done a whole selection of pop stuff you've got uh metal stuff and and funk stuff i know that you've done a lot yeah. of funk and, and old, old school sort of hip-hop r&b yeah exactly yeah um yeah i know i'm playing with a handful of those bands it's really <laughs> this weekend you know i'm heading off to the caribbean and we're playing with like sugar hill gang and cameo oh wow and i'm, I'm nice. psyched about that but um fantastic uh, so moving pictures was on the what got you that was the record that that impacted you as a kid you're a yeah. drummer obviously so yeah neil parrot was uh was your driving force um how long have you been playing drums i i, I started playing drums uh in 1979 
Okay. And as part of a music school, uh, music program, my brother had played drums before me. He switched to bass and there was a broken snare drum floating around the house and it, it lost the, the strainer. So it just, okay. and it was terribly tuned. So it sounded like a, a an old timpani. Oh. And I just knew that 2001 space odyssey had this big drum in it. Boom, so when boom, I, when I boom. hit it and it's like, Oh man, that's a 2001 drum. I got to hit this thing harder. <laughs> that is awesome. I- yeah. Had you uh, had you seen any live music up till that point? Any live uh, concerts? Uh, actually, my 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 gateway concert was Cheap Trick on the Dream Police oh, tour. God. Yeah, Man. that was my first rock concert, and I was a Bunny Carlos devotee. Ah, uh, you know, I just played with them in October down in uh, oh, in Cancun. It's yeah. a tough thing. I mean, Dax is a great drummer, right? Yeah. But, it, but it's a strange thing, isn't it, to see it without Bunny? Yeah, you know, without like, Bunny, I um. I, you know, well, as a drummer who's not an original member of the band, you know, I have to give, you know, some grace. I mean, Dax is the killer player and he's got yep. great pedigree. And I know that there's been, there have been many times when people lash out at me because I'm not an original Flock of Seagulls member, right? Sure, sure. But I try to kill them with kindness and at least honor the legacy of the band the best I can. Uh, how do you feel about bands that have come around? Because you've worked with some huge artists that have had sort of then follow up bands, you know, you've, you've had artists. Well, yeah, my big, two of my biggest, so there are three rock and roll hall of famers that li- I'm in Reno, by the way, for anyone who's wondering where we're, we're, shoot, we're coming from Reno, Nevada. Uh, and there's, um, you know, not known for being the musical Mecca, but there's Nevada has tax incentives too. Uh, <laughs> I know that was a big selling point. Sure. Uh, so a lot of people move this, move to Nevada to get away from California tax and, our three Hall of Famers, I think, all came for similar reasons. So we have Doug Clifford from Creedence Clearwater, Mike Love of the Beach Boys, and then David Coverdale of uh, White Snake and Deep Purple, and they're all clients of mine. Wow! And uh, so the 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 biggest album that I actually mixed that went multiple platinum is the Creedence Clearwater Revisited okay. live album without Fogarty, this with a different singer. So, uh, and then Mike Love of the Beach Boys. You know, Mike has the name to use the Beach Boys. Um, with you know, uh, and it's you know two of the original members, and then all new players filling in the blanks. While Brian Wilson has his own thing going on, and then Coverdale, is, you know, has owned White Snake from the beginning, right. and he is it, White Snake. He so, is White Snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the iterations. It's interesting because you and I talked a little bit about White Snake prior. Ah, of course, man, I'm a huge fan, and uh, you know, talked about Gateway albums. You know, I think. I, I would say slide it in was the one that really got me, you know, back. Good there. choice. And, oh man. I, you know, cozy. Gunbar, or cozy Powell. Cozy. That's right. Yeah. Cozy, cozy Powell. And then, you know, of course, when Aldridge came in too, you know, it was just, it was uh, a next level sort of thing. And I, uh, the, the self-titled and, and slip of the tongue, you know, incredible records. I've got a Tommy Aldridge stick around here somewhere that I caught it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, back in Montana, nice. right? You know, I mean, you, nice. you, you grew up in Reno, right? Or in Nevada. And if you didn't go to Vegas, you weren't seeing a lot of the massive arena concerts, right? I Actually, mean, it was San Francisco. That's okay. four hours from here. It's it's nine hours to Vegas. Okay. Yeah. All right. Wow. So, uh, and I've done enough Reno shows. I should know that. And we drive <laughs> everywhere. So, but Montana, you know, we might get Billings, Montana, or just yeah. three hours from where I was at, or we'd drive to Spokane, you know, which is 12. But, um, I know that uh, those kinds of things, like having to drive to a concert that far is even more impactful, you know, as a kid, right? Because the destination sort of gives you this magic of, oh, you, you know, the anticipation of going to see them and, and yep. then all the way home, you know, your eyes are, are, are yeah. you know, <laughs> right. the memories. It, it's, um, those are formative years, you know, that, that I know it lit a fire under me to want to play drums for a career. Was that kind of how it was for you too? When you'd see concerts and you thought, oh, this is it. Well, yeah, it, 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 the, the the drumming initiation was uh, more from the fact there was this other drum laying around. I tried it and I heard Cheap Trick Live at Budokan mm. and uh, my brother was playing in a band and the drummer left his drum set there. And for some reason, I don't know how, I just listened to that version of Eighth and a Shame a thousand times. Oh, and I just sat there and I played it and everyone looked at me and said, how did you learn to do that? And I go, well, I just listened to the album a thousand times. Oh. First time I ever sat at a, a drum set, I did a reasonably good rendition of that drum solo and they said uh we're getting you a drum set <laughs> and oh ironically it's a, it's a so i got a 66 
a Ludwig club date kit oh, nice. um, for Christmas that year. And that I've re I've refurbed. Yeah. And bunny posted on his Facebook like three months ago about this vintage Ludwig kit. He uses with a, a snare stand for the rack Tom. Yeah. And I, 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 I do the same thing with that old Ludwig kit and it just chokes the shell Yeah, and it bums me out because the tone's really good when it's on the shell. So I actually said, well, he'll never reply. I said, Hey, what do you do to prevent it from resonating? And he actually replied to me. He said, Oh yeah, well, I, I just don't tighten it all the way. Don't choke it. Oh, I'm yeah. like, well, thanks bunny Carlos for yeah. the sage advice. <laughs> but, By the way, this is the drum set you inspired my parents to buy for me in 79, but I'm not going to go into it right now. <laughs> God, man, you know, it was amazing. <laughs> it, 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 it was, it's funny that you have that reverence for him because if he knew all the stuff that you had done too, you know, he'd probably right. he'd be, he'd be impressed by, you know, the work you'd done. I, I do the same thing when I'm using like a one up, two down or one up, one down. I'll, I'll use a snare yeah. stand and I just put it on the outer rim, you know, so I make sure that it's never touching, you know, the, the outside of the, the edge too. So it's basically just barely hanging on. So if I do tighten it, at least it'll just hold on to the, the outer rim edge, you know, but. Someone else jumped in on the thread though and showed me these new suspension systems uh -huh. that sit be beneath the shell and the stand and, the, and another one for the feet of the floor, Tom. I'll, I'll send you a link for it. I yeah. can't remember. And man, it woke the drum up. I, they arrived last week and I tried them on and it was night and day. That's incredible. Uh, look, yeah. As an engineer, uh, right? I mean, yeah. you've seen all the things it can do to, to choke a drum and, and yeah. kind of kill the life. I, um, you know, and I would imagine, I've talked to a couple of engineers on this show and they have secrets, right? There are, secret, there are little magic tricks that you've learned along the way that, um, that they're, they're tricks of the trade that I would imagine you kind of have to hang on to and, and you know, hold those things close to your your vest otherwise people are going to steal them and try to do that at their home recording well, well I mean, we, we kind of st steal it from you know we used to have a studio here where i got my, my my chops called granny's house which was a big two room two big studio eight bedroom complex where I, we did most of the big work and la suit la clients or big national clients would come with la or new york engineers and i had assist them on you know cutting drums on their dates and see what they did and picked up some of those little uh, tricks along the way I have to ask, because um, I have great friends that are engineers here in Portland that have amazing studios that oftentimes will send their, their mastering off. You know, they'll go to Grunman's or whatever down in L.A. Yeah, yeah, right. But but um, the, uh, the sort of the advent of people with Pro Tools at home, you know, having their own home recording studios, um, does it does it bother you at all? Does it drive you nuts? Or are you the guy that gets to clean up when they mess up and they say, okay, we, we tried this at home and it just sucks. And so we need you to make it better. Well, it's funny. I, I, <laughs> I, I, there, I was, when I first went freelance in 99, I was advised by a great engineer, Brant Biles, who's, you know, done everything from Michael Jackson to Guar, you know, mm. never master your own work. You'll yeah. just try to remix it. And, uh, I said, mm, that makes sense to me. Uh, but there were so many people out there that my clients couldn't afford to go to a Bernie Grumman or yeah. a master disc. Sure where they sent it to someone who was charging 300 bucks and ruined it. And I actually lost work in genres of music because of bad mastering jobs. Oh. So I, I, I kind of said, Hey, if you won't go below X amount of dollars for a mastering job, just let me do it. Cause I will do better than these charlatans that sure. have ruined, ruined my, my income stream. Sure. Oh yeah. Of bad work. So, uh, and so above that, I, I then I say, if you got anyone that's more than that, I'm, I'm guessing they're good. And I'm a big fan of Scott Hull at oh, master disc sure. uh, in New York and, um, Marco Migliari, who was with Peter Gabriel's real world. He has oh, a, a mastering God. suite at real world. I've worked with him at real world. Um, that, that's so, in bath, right? Yeah, that's exactly. Amazing. Wow. Well, actually it's literally, it's, in, it's in box 10 okay. kilometers away from bath. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. Oh. I, I, I honestly, I'm not in the studio, but, um, oh, okay, okay. I, I, I just love it there. Our first date is in Wales. And, and the first time I went to Bath, I, I just thought, okay, I get why Peter Gabriel never wants to leave this place. Yeah. You know? It's pretty breathtaking. But, uh, pretty breathtaking. I'll tell my friends there that you're playing though. So they go uh, check you out. Yeah, please. I'll, <laughs> I'll glad to hook them up. Yeah. Uh, oh, fair enough. All right. <laughs> Uh, unless they absolutely hate a flock of seagulls or they're such fans that they say, Oh, if it's not the original band, screw those guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I'll win them over. I, I do that. I try to, try I to bet make, you do. I, try I bet to kill you do. Dinas. But, right. um, the, um, and uh, showmanship. 
Uh, well, you know, that's part of it too, right? I mean, as a drummer, um, well, you probably saw the intro video, right? I've had a yeah. couple. I've had a couple of pretty notable studio drummers on the show, right? Yes, you have. I don't know <laughs> yeah. why I'm here, actually. Oh no, man! I mean, I, I really, um, and I'll get to why I'm really excited to have you here. And we should thank uh, our mutual friend Kenny Davis for connecting us, Kenny right? Kenny Davis. Oh Love my him. God! I can't believe he did this. For tell me. me, tell me a Kenny Davis story back in high school. Can you give me one? Uh, well, yeah. So Kenny and I were at a brand new high school. Uh, called McQueen High School. We were the the first kids there, and we marched in the band together. And we had this um, uh, band director from Mississippi that was redhead that was trying to make this whole new program come together. And I was uh, marching snare with with Kenny, and uh, we we we. It was a tough start. Whenever you start a new learning pro- program, a new institution of learning, there's always bumps in the road, sure. and um, so, you know, it, it was just a lot of us getting our asses handed to us at band competitions and stuff like that uh, as as we got to learn the ropes together. And and to be honest, I, I, I'm i sad to say that I actually haven't seen him in decades. It's only been through Facebook that we've reconnected after school. I might have seen him briefly at a reunion, but seeing his footage on on uh the internet and facebook i I can't believe how what a great player he's become oh yeah man great unbelievable and you know and you and i will probably agree on this that we know a million great drummers out there but it doesn't matter if you're not a great human you know Mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing about kenny is that his heart is pure you know and and the fact that when he connected us, you know, he he spoke with reverence towards both of us. And, I, you know, that's typical Kenny. You know, that he I've never heard him speak poorly about anyone, to be honest with you, when he could easily, especially in this town. Yeah, uh, we both sure. know, you know some people here that uh, we could easily rant about. But I, I love the fact that he keeps it positive. Yeah. Yeah. That, sometimes that can be hard, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's but, <laughs> well, yeah, good on you, Kenny. Yes. Greatly appreciated. Here's to you, Kenny. Um uh, so dr- drummers that uh, we uh, that I've had on the show, some guys, some studio guys, drink. Mm. <laughs> Aaron Off was one of the first that totally blew my mind. I, I thought that was Kenny. Yeah, I was, was wondering if that it was, was Kenny. Kenny. Okay. Yes, and, uh, okay. and I, I definitely welcome you to go back and check it out. And guys, if you're watching this and you're drummers or engineers, you'll really enjoy this study, the stories that Kenny had. I couldn't shut him up, and I'm a I talker. <laughs> I'm a talker. We went two hours and I finally had to say, we got to set up a part two, my friend. I'm sorry because yeah, I got to go. Yeah. But he, in the backdrop, right, he had platinum records. And I said, um, I'm glad that you took the room where you've got your platinum records up, right? Because, uh, you know, that's, and he said, I mean, the whole house is full of platinum records. But it, <laughs> I said, well, I, I know you've done a lot. Like you've done like, what, 3,000 records? And he goes, uh, over 3,000 that are gold, platinum, and diamond. I'm like, oh, Okay. Yeah. Wow. Don't insult right. the guy. I, Come on. Right. And <laughs> and truthfully, um, I went. You know, I've looked at his discography, and and rightly so. I mean, there's when when you talk to other drummers, and they they speak about what it is that makes Kenny so special. I'm interested to know from your aspect. You're I a drummer. It was the technique. The yeah. Technique. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how he counts, right? He because he has the subdivision in his in his stroke. That's what he talks about. He did say that there's a oh, okay, okay. There, there's there a was count a, there. There was but, math behind it. Okay, good. Yeah. No, but um, but you know, really between uh, you know, his drumming and also just um, his reliability or his consistency, I think that's probably a big thing as an engineer yeah, and yeah, as a drummer. Yeah. Um, I, I you know when you get called for somebody and they want to have a name like that, right? So. Kenny comes at a price tag that's probably prohibitive to some people at a, yeah. at a lower budget. Um, yeah. And so when you've got to find somebody that has what Kenny has, so what is it that people are seeking? A uh, pocket. Yeah. Reliable time. Yeah. You know, you know, is that important. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> funny, huh? I right. know. Yeah. Right. Uh, and you know, uh, what, probably the, 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 I've been very fortunate to work with the drummer who plays, who played a lot with Cracker and Camper Van Beethoven, okay. who also played with um, uh, Joey Ramone, a guy named Frank Fanero. Okay. Uh, and Frank, we're finishing a solo album of his. And I, I, you know, when he was on tour with Cracker or Camper, we would try to get him here in Reno to do session work while he was in town because 
his pocket was invaluable. Mm. You it, 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 you'd, you'd give him a click to maybe start it, turn it off, and then every take ended at the same place. Wow, really? Oh, yeah, Panero was a machine, a, a, absolutely remarkable, and that's why Joey Ramone, when he, uh, every time he saw him, he was in the Del Lords back in the CBGB days, and he's like, "You're a good drummer, Frank," and then he's like, "Well, use me on your solo album," and eventually he did. Right on. That it's funny because I think of Ramones. I think of just frantic, you know, frenetic pace where it's just yeah. pushing all the time. But yeah, the, right. You know, but even the count offs are fast. Right. <laughs> That's true. And then it gets faster. But <laughs> right. you know, like Todd Zuckerman, another one, right? Yeah. Like Todd, you know, like drummers know him for his chops, of course, but the precision that, that guy has. You know, you talked about consistency, yeah. you know, and I, I'm floored and his stories too were about that magic, you know, you and I talked about going to concerts and how exciting it was to go and come back and have like a whole new appreciation for what live music was. Right. He, he talked about the first time he went into a, a drum shop in Chicago at age 10 and uh -huh. how was he it Frank's. We, it was. Yeah, exactly. He went up the elevator. That's when I went to Frank's for the first okay. time. <laughs> he said he recreated his studio downstairs to be like that. When he walked, oh. open the elevators. If you look on his, in any of his videos, he's got, snares all yep. lining the walls and it was just like that that uh it was oh, a, it's fun funny. fun to look back at that but, oh uh, funny i love that as an engineer um do you uh do you have like sort of a rotating cast of guys that you use as call guys because i mean you could easily be that guy too do you just step in and, and fill the drums when somebody needs a good pocket oh, funny thing i i i learned long ago not to be a drummer and engineer on the same session because you can't serve two masters. Sure. Uh, I, 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 I encourage everyone not to do it. There are just so many moving parts with percussion and micing with the different microphones and stuff. Uh, yeah. So for battle scar, I actually brought in my second engineer to, to focus on engineering so I could focus on playing. Right. And yeah. Um, but in terms of the other, uh, uh, players, uh, I, there, there's a stable of, of session players here in Reno that, I, I, I call it from when I, when I, when I, when I have need to, but a lot of the acts I'm working with that are like local regional acts or bands that are trying to develop themselves. So it's my job to help them grow as a group. Okay. And I, I use their drummer and I use their guitar player. And I'm like, you know, I'm not doing the, um, the Alan Parsons where, you know, we strip everyone out and just keep the lead singer. You know, it's, it's right. or the Brian Wilson. We're um, with all session people. Uh, we have uh, surprisingly a, a amazing drummer here in town named Tony Savage, who was Engelbert Humperdinck's drummer off and on for like 30 years. Wow. And it, and it was with Tony that I realized what makes a session player a great session player is if they can play to a click effortlessly. Cause yeah, I struggle with it cause I don't practice enough. Sure. You know, I'm now an engineer more than a drummer, but, there are, there are drummers who, who are just so used to it and so comfortable with it where it doesn't mess their brain and they can still express themselves with, 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 with no problem over a click. Yeah. And, and when that relaxed approach comes to a click there, that's a good session drummer. That's man. That's a, I, I like to have it sort of quantified that way. You know, I, yeah. um, it, for drummers that are not at all used to a click. And I know for me, the first times I had to use them, um, getting into the '80s pop stuff, you know, where you, you had to probably play the back. spit in their face, didn't you? <laughs> I just, I, I knew that it felt uncomfortable for sure. Yeah, you know, I didn't yeah, feel like yeah. I could float at all, and I felt constrained. And now I, I welcome it. Now I really, oh, do good. Like there, you go. I, there you go. There you go. I think, um, but if I listen to certain tracks that I've recorded, and I go back and I listen to where I float around the, the click, um, sometimes it's appropriate. And sometimes, you know, you know, I mean, really, I mean, where, where you want to be just on top of it for a certain yeah, part, you know, the chorus yeah. and then just lay back just behind it on, a, mm -hmm. you know, on the verses, but, but, you know, the floating, you know, and, and unintentional stuff is unfortunately, you know, it's a, it's a fault of mine and, and it, like you, I don't practice enough. So, right. <laughs> um, even like you mentioned, not like you, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you, you brought up battle scar and I'm glad you did because this was the real defining moment for me. Um, Kenny mentioned that his friend had put together this amazing project um, as a uh, a benefit for a cause that you were near and dear to. So let me maybe get uh, from your perspective. Uh, tell me about how this project came about for you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> long history here. So um, when I was at USC, I studied recording arts at USC, and I had a a friend who became a very famous famous filmmaker, uh, Brian Singer. 
who did the usual suspects yeah at pupil the first two x-men films days of future past uh apocalypse valkyrie jack the giant slayer and uh bohemian rhapsody and he created the show house oh my god so brian just exploded so his first short film uh was this a short film with ewan mcgregor who he went to high school with um uh, uh, called at pupil and he was having a screening in los angeles my senior year at usc and we all went to go support him at his screening and uh sam raimi a very young sam raimi uh who then went on to direct you know spider-man and yeah. he had just done evil dead 2 and and i actually was recording his younger brother that day at usc for a film project really uh, oh yeah ted raimi and um and Ted was had noticed that Sam stole all of his Spike Mulligan records to get jokes to MC the event that oh night, and he was predicting which jokes he was going to steal. And he was pretty close to right. And yeah. uh, so we we're there, and and it's Brian's films, Lions Den, and two other good short, you know, student films. But Lions Den was heads heads and heads and tail, just heads above the other two. I'm in the the the, and this is at the um, LA Directors Guild building in, in on Sunset Boulevard, and. I'm just hanging out, hanging with friends from SC, and I see this tall guy in the hors d'oeuvre line and start chatting him up, and it turns out he's from Canada. And I said, wow, big Rush fan. And he's like, well, if you're a Rush fan, you you're you know what Battlescar is, right? Mm. And I'm like, I'm a pretty big Rush fan. <laughs> I'm the tallest one in this room. I'm 6'8". You can't tell in the wow. video. Wow, yeah. I'm 6'8". And he said, well, you just, you can't really call yourself a rush fan unless you know battle scar. Right. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> come on here. Right. And he's like, well, come with me. I'll, I'll, I'll educate you. <laughs> and I, I have no idea. I, this is, I only saw this guy this, that night. I have never seen him since, but I, and this wasn't probably the smartest thing I've ever done. Uh, I've gone to, I went to a stranger's car in Hollywood at 10 30 at night, uh, got in the stranger's car and he popped in this cassette of universal juveniles wow. and, and played me battle scar and completely melted my face off. Oh man. And, it's so huge. Oh geez. It's bonkers. And I walked back in afterwards, you know, practically drooling, thanking this guy profusely for having played this song for me. Yeah. And, uh, walked back in and there's Brian Singer and Sam Raimi talking to each other with another mutual friend, uh, my, our friend Paul. And I walk up to the three of them and Paul says, you know, the future of Hollywood's in this room right now, which was correct yeah absolutely <laughs> so so that was the weird start of battle scar fast forward to 97 i'm working at granny's house and i'm uh working with a group called the urge that was on the same label as incubus and oh. um uh, 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 uh corn okay right? yeah immortal and the producer was this guy named garth richardson and garth you most know his work uh, from the first Rage Against the Machine album. He oh, produced wow. Killing in the Name of. Oh, my and, God. And when you look at the credits on the back of anything Garth has produced, uh, it's spelled produced by Garth, just his first name, all caps, G-G-G-A-R-T-H. Produced by okay. Because he has a severe stutter. Okay. Produced by Garth. Okay. And he, and, he plays yeah. into it. Yeah, he totally has a good sense of humor about it. And in talking to him... His father was a legendary producer named Jack Richardson, who had recorded all the Moby Grape stuff, wow. uh, as well as uh, uh, Alice and Cheap Trick and Max Webster. Mm. His dad recorded Battle Scar. Oh, my God. Produced it. Wow. And I'm like, oh, my God. Tell yeah. me everything, <laughs> Garth. Tell me everything. And Garth said, well, I watched it. My dad invited me to the session. I was oh a big fan God. of both bands. So he was 20 and got to visit the session at, at uh, phase one. Wow. And, uh, so in that period, that month that we worked together in 97, my memory of him mentioning it to me was it was the second take. Even though there were more takes recorded, they kept take two. Wow. Okay. Uh, apparently there are Kim Mitchell interviews that say it was take one they kept. Okay. Uh, but Jack used to lecture at universities around Canada at recording classes and would play outtakes to people. Oh. And I, oh God, I'd love to hear the no kidding. Yeah. Yeah. So around that time is when I started really brainstorming about, I would love to do a Reno all-star version, a uh, battle scar and the studio granny's house, which later became Sierra Sonics, where we, we uh, did that urge record. And a lot of the other albums I did was a huge, huge tracking room and oh. more than enough room to pull off battle scar. That would have been just fine. Uh, however, I left there. <laughs> I went okay. freelance. And took over a different studio 
and there's a little sister city to Reno called Sparks. Uh, that's yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, we, I, I, the studio I'm at, uh, uh, most of the time is in, in Sparks called Amirage Sound Labs, which is much smaller. And I'm like, oh, I don't think I can fit it in here. But in 2008, the other drummer that I wanted to do the second drum part threatened to move to Austin. Okay. I'm like, okay, I got to do it. I got to do it. I got, I, I got to. Damn it! I'm just going to do it. So I got the the two drummers, two bass players, two guitar players, and one of the singers shoehorned into our little studio, um, and we did uh, 20 takes one night, <laughs> and 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 it wasn't there. And we came back another night and did 20 more. And I'm happy to announce the rhythm bed is 99.9 percent one take. Really? It's take wow. 40. It's yeah. take 40. Right. <laughs> but um, there's only one edit on the, right. on the on the music bed. Wow, uh, that, we're very that's proud tough. of. Oh, it is, the, and very I mean, much unlike my production style. <laughs> two bass drum or two bassists and two drummers in that. You know, I mean, it's it, with. I don't know how much you've played with the other drummer. You know, but that is uh, very little. Very that's little. crazy. You know, really. I mean, is because two drummers that, that haven't played together a lot have a completely different approach to time. Even yeah, though yeah, time, time is yeah. sort of finite, right? But I was yeah. thinking about that. I thought, I wonder how much, you know, you guys really just explored it together. But part part of the reason it was 40 takes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> I, I, I wanna I wanna ask you about it, the, but then wanna, how is it that Neil and Guy McCracken did it in two? He, well they don't play that much together either. It's a They're Canadian friend. thing. Canadian yeah, thing. Canadian thing. <laughs> I think it is. Uh, you know this, right? Canadian you know. time. I, yeah. I I I I feel such a um a connection to folks up there. I mean, especially Toronto. I don't know why. I I just have this this real special bond with with folks in that area, and they've become dear friends to me. I feel like an honorary Canadian when I'm up there. And oh, fantastic! I, I, I talk to them more. Oh, in fact, our guitarist Gord Depp from the Spoons um, had gone back. You know, he um, they were on Anthem Records, right? And so, oh, okay, yeah. When he first joined the band about four or five years ago. And I remember sitting down at uh, his first rehearsal with us and he's flipping through his phone and I'm like, wait, is that Getty? And he goes, oh, you know, Getty Lee. I'm like, what are you talking oh. about? He goes, oh yeah, well, you know, we shared a record label together. We were in the right. you know, same, same place all the time and they're shutting the studio down. They're shutting Anthem Records down. And so they're just clearing out the house. So they just asked me to go in and take whatever I wanted. And I was like, please let me go what? there. And, and and he said, you know, regrettably, I'm not much of a Rush fan. I said, dude, okay, just go in and get stuff for me, you know. So oh he's got a massive God. collection of cool Rush stuff, and you know, it's. But I want to ask you, it's speaking of that, about this picture, okay? So I'm going to share this. With you. Can you tell me? <laughs> tell me what? Went, yeah, someone what, went hunting. <laughs> yes, tell me what this picture is all about, my friend. Okay, so that's Snakes and Arrows tour, um, wow. uh, right? Uh, and I. Uh, I, my former boss at that studio that Granny South that became Sierra Sonics, um, the the owner Tim Tucker knew the head of security for Rush, who was a private investigator and had reason to to know him and work with him. And when this tour happened, he said, "Hey, I know Neil's private bodyguard who might be able to help you." So they, I didn't get to meet Neil. I just got to meet Getty and Alex as part of the cattle call, oh, which really? they do. Yeah, yeah, so that's just part of the catacol. And but ironically, Brian Singer is friends with them and has had dinner with all three of them and stuff. So oh, uh, I was hoping I could maybe use that as a shoehorn to, to get, maybe strike a conversation. But they I, and this is interesting. If you ever anyone out there, if you ever find yourself in the cattle call at, backstage at a show before a show for a bunch of photos, because they charge a lot of money to be in this cattle call. Mm -hmm. If you're the first one in the cattle call. You're in and out. You get yeah. your picture and then they shoo you away. That doesn't it's change even if you're in the back, is it really? No, because then you get to stand in line the whole time and uh, watch the interaction with everyone else. Sure. So you actually get the most time backstage if you're the last one in line. So if I'm ever in that position, I always let people go me so I can be the last one in line. Because usually the interaction with the other fans is actually fun to watch. Sure. Oh, especially and, with that band, right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. It's an obsession. Yeah. I, and, well, so the, uh, the, the, we were the first one and I, 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 uh, Getty there is like, uh, 
on his tippy toes trying to be as tall as I am because <laughs> oh, nice. I'm 6'8". <laughs> okay. And there with my brother, David, who turned me on to Rush. So it was a big deal that he and I were able to do it. Unfortunately, my brother-in-law, Kirk, was there and we, could, we couldn't get a third pass. So I've always felt bad that I've not wow. been able to get a, a pass for my brother-in-law for this backstage thing. But the fact that Getty's trying to skid on his yeah. tippy toes <laughs> made Alex laugh out loud. <laughs> oh, I, see, but, but, but that look on Alex's face is what I always see of him. You know, yes, that's the, thing. That's, like, that's the Alex look. So exactly. exuberant and, and watching even a couple of years ago, right? Max Webster and Rush got together yeah. again and they, they did it. Well, well, Alex I, did. You're Alex I, did. That's I, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, um, and and he looks like this on stage right he's and it's very laid back the version that they did right it's a, yeah. it's a different vibe but yep he um he just seems like he'd be such a fun hang you know just getting yeah. right there looks like okay get this cattle call over with but <laughs> but I, I um there's a there's a canadian personality that i know well from all the shows that we've done named cave on oh, who has okay. a youtube channel and as I don't know that he intends to do this, but he is very off-putting to a lot of artists. And so he'll find his way backstage and he tries to interview them and, you know, ask them questions. He would ask oh. Getty about the third outfit he had back on, you know, on uh, uh, Fly By Night when they were recording um, the video. And uh, and oh, Alex, no. you know, so, you know, did you notice that in the one video in the live show, you had your third button undone? He's that guy. And I, I've seen him backstage with Neil or with Getty and Alex. Actually, Neil's never there, right? Of course, never, but never. But yeah. uh, that that's the same look that Getty has in that picture. He's so done with the, the shenanigans that have happened backstage, you know. And it uh, it's unfortunate, right? Because yeah. I see a lot of interviews where he's so endearing and, and you know and humble. That's the hum the humility is, is the most beautiful thing, you know, about all of those guys, even Neil, right? That. People might have considered him to be, um, you know, sort of pretentious because he didn't talk to fans, but it was that he was shy, right? He was Very, just Yeah, shy. yeah. He was not comfortable with fame. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, you know, it's hard for me to understand. Like, not because I am famous, but because I just love talking to everybody. Yeah, you know? right, but, right. It's a different uh, mindset. For sure. Oh, I'll yeah. have you know, yes. Neil Peart and I say, share birthdays. Do you really? September okay. September 12th. Wow. Yeah. All right. So you've, uh, um, there's gotta be a kinship there, you know, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately it's passing because it would have been nice yeah. for you to, to, you know, break bread maybe, uh, yeah, you know, sure. Birthday. I had a plan for that because I, uh, so Brian Singer, I did ask at that lineup, did Brian reach you in LA and Alex turned to me and said, yeah, we saw him. Okay. He, he invited them to the set of X-Men. They got to mm. watch part of the filming. Um, but, uh, so, uh neil and 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 uh brian also were big car buffs and friends talking about cars so right. the red the red barchetta yeah that the song's about right if you read uh neil's ghostwriter book right yeah uh he's the 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 song the the vehicle that inspired that song was here in reno it was a uh, Harris automobile collection. And every time they would come play here in the seventies, Neil would go visit the automobile automobile mm -hmm. collection. And when he went back in the nineties, that had been sold and he was kind of bummed about mm -hmm. that. And he wrote about it in ghostwriter. So I said, okay, when I have millions of disposable income, I'm going to, cause my dad worked, my dad was a light man for Harris for 41 years and told me not to do lights. So here I am not doing lights. <laughs> right. And, and, uh, but have contacts with Harris. I could find out who bought that Barchetta and I wanted to buy it and give it to Neil mm. on our birthday. That was the oh, plan. Oh man. What a cool opportunity that would have been, you know, yep. just even the fact that you were thinking about it, <laughs> you know, last year, right. When they, they auctioned off his car. Yep. Yeah. I, um, you know, my son and I, we just ruled about all of them. You know, he had the old Ferrari and the old Porsche and, and you know, a lot of the gray cars, right? He was a big yep. fan of those gray Love cars. Love those but, gray uh, silver cars, oh, yeah. Jeez, man. I, uh, uh, well, I didn't expect to be rapping with you this much about Rush, but I do <laughs> want to say that. Nerd, nerd. So the transition, I mean, you talked about this discovery, right, of Battlescar and what it meant to you. Now, this transition of, of wanting to do this and record this and really turned it into, um, honoring a, a cause that you believe in. Um, what's the, what was your connection behind that? Uh, excellent segue. Um, the, um, uh, so the guy who I now work with at this studio called Amirage 
is a local chiropractor named Dr. Lawrence Davis, who's the longest running studio owner in the state of Nevada. Wow. And uh, he and I did a charity record 15 years ago for AIDS research. It was a Christmas album called Spike Dagnog, which was like rock Christmas songs. Oh, nice. And then, and then 10 years ago, we did a huge charity Christmas album for the Juvenile Di- Diabetes Research Foundation. You bet. Um, but we always thought we should do something for music in the schools because, A, I'm a product of it. Yeah. I, you know, K through 12, I was in music programs I'm a, 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 and, and then went to USC, was studied music there. Um, and we, those are the kids that will end up coming to record it with us. You know, Absolutely. we wanted to do something to kind of uh, go back with um, the program of the of our of our town so that's how we wanted to support the 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 arts and with everything the arts is the first thing that gets cut uh and you know not just music obviously fine arts as well uh, sculpture painting dance uh it's all of it's on the chopping block when when those budget cuts come and uh so you know, we, we, we kind of made a deal with the Washington County School District for the arts department. It's more, my, I kind of geared it towards music, but I, I have a feeling it hopefully it will help some other disciplines as well. As well. Um, but then halfway through the production of the music video, because uh, the song, for decades, I was trying to find the interpretation of the album and uh, the, of the tune, and I couldn't yeah. find one. Then the lyrics are kind of vague. It seems like this vague protest song a song about the plight of native Americans, which inspired the idea of the video. Sure. And I said, well, I'll be an absolute hypocrite if I don't help a native American cause, if I'm making this whole native American themed, uh, protest video. Sure. Uh, so, um, the, 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 the actor, Richard James, who played our, who starred in the video was a referral from a, a professor I, I teach with at the university of Nevada, Reno, um, who, Dr. James um, um, Mer- Merton Running Wolf, who who um, you know has his film degree from USC and his master's in filmology from from Stanford, and you know gave me a lot of ideas on what causes are the ones that are really worth focusing on here in the United States for um, Native American causes. And the American Indian Graduate um, um, Center was is this organization out of Santa Fe that gets scholarship dollars for. Native uh, American Indian students who are trying to get into college wow. uh, here in the U.S. So b- with that input, that's we kind of split the two causes in half. Oh, fantastic. Like, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned like trying to get to the root um, sort of interpretation of the video with the lyrics. Um, I've got a lyric video here and I was going to play a little bit of this. I, uh, I want to direct people to go out and seek out the link that we have below the battle scar dot inspired dash amateur.com. Uh, because there's a way that you can help support this cause, but uh, I'm going to share just a little bit of this lyric video and uh, check out the production on this. This is so wicked. So if you don't mind, uh, well, uh, yeah, quite, quite, are you, um, just so you know that there's a, a music video in addition to the lyric video that has a whole narrative video back and forth with actors. And this is yeah. just the musicians and the choir. That's right. Yeah. And and so when you go to that link below, you'll actually see the music video and it's really powerful. Uh, one thing, I, and I would do want to talk to you about the video and, and sort of some of my takeaway from it too, but okay, uh, great, great. I'll give the lyric yep. video here just so we can get a great sense of uh, how well this is produced. All right. So this is Battle Scar. <laughs> Screw the feet and make the heat 
of course, there is uh, there is a narrative there that talks about the oppression of Native American, uh, especially by this um, white man coming in and sort of you know taking over this land. But what I loved is that you showed the marginalized, you showed the voices of other uh, nationalities and and uh, communities and groups that needed their voices heard. And so you got all of those elements into this video beyond um, this very important cause of, of Native American oppression. Um, obviously, there was, that was not an accident. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, <laughs> well said. <laughs> uh, and you, um, so were, did you end up helping produce this video then as well? I mean, I know that you engineered the track and produced the track and played on it, right? Right. I, I actually was the producer of the music video and I came up with the concept mm -hmm. um, and uh, storyboarded it. I drew yeah. a storyboard for the whole thing. Um, the, guy, the guy who directed was a guy named Tyler Borns, who he and I worked together for Whitesnake. So he's done the last seven or eight Whitesnake music videos and live concert videos and has won two Emmys. And wow. I worked with him on a few independent movies uh, when I do sound for film. And so I pitched him this idea and... Um, he was able to execute it. And then, um, the, I, so I, I, I was struggling to find what the lyric was about when I was trying to figure out what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen a couple interpretations by various people online that said, Oh, it's kind of this vague protest song about the plight of native Americans. I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, so I had the idea of a native American going into a therapist's office. And one of my best, best besties is the actress who played our therapist, uh, Jill Marlene. I've known her okay. since middle school and she's an actual therapist, actual singer. And I said, wow, if I had this native American coming to see this, this thing, I can, I can also, and with, with this, you know, spoiler where watch the music video before you jump into this part, because you know, the, the, our, our antagonist, the politician, mm -hmm. uh, is facing, who's oppressing our, uh, our, our native American lead actor, uh, then has to face all these other marginalized people that, uh, th have been historically been beat up here. Sure. And I, ironically, Jill is actually a huge, um, um, uh, what's the word feminist, but she just rallies for any cause. Sure, and, and yeah. Yeah. So she's hip to all these things. And I've learned so much from these things from her that I was able to incorporate this also when we were developing it, there was, there was the whole border dispute about the kids being left at the border in, oh. in Mexico. And I had uh, uh, my friend Monique and her gorgeous son uh, who, who um, looked you know perfect for that part. I had a, a Muslim student at UNR who brought in a friend as the Muslim couple local bass player Gia Torcaso uh with her her wife uh, as the gay couple and then Jill had a very good friend um Stephen Patterson who's another local musician African American actor okay. and so we, we were bringing the whole racial interracial thing back in when sh she reappeared at the end of the video so there was you know trying to encapsulate all these bits and yeah. um and uh you know, the order of how stuff was, was revealed actually changed from the original storyboards and Tyler had a better way to present it. So thank you, Tyler. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until well after shooting while we were still in post-production, when I was introduced to a, a Max Webster historian named Bob Wagner, who's writing a book about Max Webster. Really? Okay. And, and he's like, you know what the song's about, don't you? And I said, well, Native American plight story. He's like, oh, no, no, no. Pi, Pi, there's an interview from 81. And I'm like, oh, I couldn't find it. And he has everything because he's doing a book about sure. it. Sure. And Pi Dubois is the lyricist. And okay. Kim Mitchell wrote the music. And ironically, Pi Dubois and Neil Peart met on the Battle Scar session and exchanged ideas that led to Tom Sawyer. Wow. That Tom Sawyer was born on the Battle Scar session. So uh, Pi wrote in a, ar an article in some Canadian music uh, trade in 81 that it's his anti-America song. Wow. Really? So I missed the boat there. And mm. you know, Pi is a, apparently a kind of a hermit now. You can't, no one can reach Pi and, you know, he's somewhere up in Canada. So if he ever sees this, I, I, he may not approve of the uh, the adaptation. Well, I'm sure that uh, it, it's like any other piece of art, right? Right, it, right. <laughs> it's a, it, it is interpretation, you know. So if you take a look yeah. at a painting or you listen to a song, you know, I mean, lyrics. I'm sure Neil would never chastise somebody because their interpretation of his lyrics were different than what he envisioned. You know, I think right. he would really appreciate the fact that 
it meant something to you, even if it yeah, wasn't, you know, right. And, uh, but I, uh, I love the, the, the Tom story, Tom Sawyer, you know, was sort of born from that session. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, and originally uh, the lyric was Louis the lawyer. Uh, Pi had a, a, an, a, an idea started called Louis the lawyer that he showed to Neil and Neil's like, yeah, we like this. And then it evolved into Tom Sawyer. Oh my gosh. That's great. So this is outlined in the behind the scenes documentary. That's also on YouTube as well. Okay. I love that. You bet. Um, all right. So rush fans, you got some, some nuggets that you may not have yeah. known about. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, so if, uh, I guess what I should ask, because you talked about sort of bisecting how you wanted the benefit to go then for battle Scar. Yeah, right. um, when they support you, um, either by d buying the download or, um, helping contribute to the fund, um, at uh, the link below. Yeah. Uh, then uh, what's the intent? Are you actually, um, are you hoping to maybe have these performed live in certain areas or, or is this going to live entirely in a digital form online? At this point, it's, it's, uh, so far it's only in this digital format, the musicians involved, one of the bass players now is getting his PhD in, in Sydney, Australia, no, Melbourne, Australia. Okay. So kind of hard to pin him down sure. uh, to do a show. Uh, in fact, we had a schedule, the, the band shoot when he was visiting from Australia. Oh, okay. um, and the original organ player on the track or, or the, the, who played on our track was the guy who co produced the Mike Love of the Beach Boys album I was doing at the time, Paul Farso, who was this organ player in the 60s in a band called The Loading Zone that was the house band at the Fillmore. Okay. That opened for Guess Who, The Who, oh The God. Dead, everybody. Wow. And he was offered a gig with Janis Joplin two weeks before she died. No and kidding. Yeah. So Paul... Wow. He's in Texas now. So, you know, this isn't a band I can just pull together. Sure. Well, unfortunately, for, especially for a one song show, who'd go to a one song show. Uh, but what I am jumping into now in terms of spreading the word is we've just started a, a, a radio campaign. Having gotten a good launch with the online campaign, I have a fabulous social media team called Narrative VR that um, kind of helped launch the, the social media campaign in a three week, a three week promotion where a lot of people, when they release a single, the day it comes out is the day it dies. Oh. And I'd had a lot of clients who experienced that. So I said, well, if I have three releases, the, the music video, the lyric video, and the behind the scenes documentary three weeks in a row, that will keep it in people's minds longer. And every time we do an update, then more people remember, oh, I should donate here. Um, so then the radio campaign is using that story in Canada first, since it was a Canadian hit. Uh, and we're hoping that, uh, so college radio in Canada is being exposed to it first, then they're going to hit American radio, um, American college radio and see, and we made a radio edit, which was hard to do, cut that down to, 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 to four Oh five, but we did it. And, um, and we'll, we'll see if we can, if radio will, will help us put it that way. And I just started submitting it to film festivals. A lot of people said, this is strong enough to, uh, to submit to film festivals. So I've been submitting, trying to submit the music video and the behind the scenes documentary as a pair. So if they both get accepted, they'll, they'll be played back to back. That's great. Yeah. I, I'm glad you've got a team behind that as yeah. well. Cause I, I, you know, if there's a lot of moving parts that are in there and, and, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not an expert in any of those parts. Uh, who is? I mean, that stuff changes all the time too. Yes, you know? but I, well, uh, yeah, yeah, man, I, I, uh, I really do applaud you. Let me ask you about those singers. All right. Oh, okay, and, okay. Oh, oh my god. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I love that you actually. There's great. There are great credits that accompany the video, so people can see. Um, all the way down to the choir. It's cool too, because you can see that there are kids as part of the choir. It's a massive sounding choir. It really is like this big tribal chant that's going on at the end there. Right. And, and uh, and the, the band, of course, those drummers are fantastic. That guy with the glasses. Oh, uh, well, uh, Jason's the good drummer. I'm the yeah, hack. Uh, no, man, there's a very Stuart Copeland look about you in the video, which is really cool. I dig. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get, I, I see what you're saying. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Stuart, yeah. Stuart, as Stuart said, I'm, I'm, I'm used to people saying I'm their second favorite drummer. <laughs> <laughs> then, well, who, who, so Jason is the other drummer, Jason Thomas, who was okay. a local metal known mo, mo for his metal playing. He was in a band that got signed to Earache called December, which was a band I produced years ago Okay, and uh, just frightening player. That sure. guy is, you would love his playing forever. So he was the other guy. I was like, he threatened to lead reno to, to austin i'm like okay i got to do this before he leaves and he never left ironically oh, he, right the, the bass player did um and then uh the two guitar players 
uh, Ryan Hall and Eric Stanglin at two different points were roommates of mine. Funny. Oh. But, uh, yeah. And they were both in the t- the first two bands I ever produced. Really? Ryan was in a band called Psycho Babble that ended up in a, a, a prog metal band called Cranium that I did a lot of work with. Okay. And Eric Stangland uh, now has his own podcast called Mixtapes that I was on recently oh. and uh, had, was in a group called Convicted Innocence. Uh, Ryan Hall, actually, the, the first guitar player, actually, I, we helped him audition for Faith No More. He, oh, he was. Wow. Billy Gould ha- gave him a, a crack at Faith No More, which was nice. amazing. And yeah. uh, then our, our bass players, uh, uh, Mario Guzman was in Psycho Babble with Ryan and Click Convicted Innocence with Eric uh, back in the day and is now part of our um, cabaret circuit with a group called Audio Box. And, um, and then the second bass player was uh, David Adams, who's now getting his PhD in Australia uh, in marine biology. He, uh, he's um, you know specializing in sea turtles. Quite really? a jump from rock and roll to sea right. turtles. Well, the, my so youngest good. is in the same same realm. Really? Yeah. Oh well, the, we should get the two of them together. Uh, so David, come coming your way. Uh, the uh, he was in Cranium with with Ryan and and, and uh, Jason. So basically, I had the entire band Cranium on okay. one side, All right. and then half of Convicted Innocence with me on the other. And I had produced every one of those bands at one point or another. That sounds the like singers Russian. are, uh, sorry, go ahead. It sounds like Russian Mac Webster, right? Like those. Two oh yeah. Bands. All right. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. So the singers now, right? This okay. is. Okay. Uh... Uh, so originally Mario, the, the bass player I had slated for being the male singer doing the Kim Mitchell part. Uh, but there was a nine year break in production. Cause right after I tracked it, my, my dad got cancer oh. and passed away and, a lot of stuff got up heaved and a lot of problems. So I didn't even run a rough mix. I didn't listen to it for nine years. Really? Yeah. And then I was like, Oh geez, I better do this. And I, 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 I cracked it open, heard the take 40 and went, I got to finish this. Yeah. So, um, uh, Lisa McQuiston was the gal who sang the Getty Lee part. She was, I had her involved from day one. It was going to be Mario and Lisa, uh, but in that, in those nine years, I worked with another band that Jason Thomas, the drummer had then moved on to called weight of the tide. And this kid, Jess Phepps, who I'd seen as a kid and I recorded in a, in a metal band a thousand years before had really grown into this very powerful singer. And I'm like, I think Jess might be a good candidate for Kim Mitchell. And if, if Mario's cool with it, which he was, thank goodness. And Jess had just beat cancer. Really? Uh, yeah, uh, he he beat cancer and really wanted to do it as a to prove to himself because he had his own battle scar at that point after having the surgeries to get everything removed and stuff. Uh, so he he did it, and then Lisa, she was she's an amazing singer that we work with a lot here in town, and um, but she was you know it's intimidating doing a Getty Lee part, you know. Oh, she very intimidating. It. She yeah. nailed it. I and that the two of them together, you know, where they're harmonizing together. There's that one point where they look each other in the eye. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, oh my God, it's it's so heavy. It's so huge. <laughs> you know, it really, man. It, it uh, that song, of course, is already a, a magnificent song. But your your uh, interpretation of it is so so good. Thank I, you uh, kindly. I, I, I'm really excited about it. So, guys, I, I've built it up a little bit. I'm going to share just a <laughs> tad bit of that uh, with you, and. Uh, um, then I implore you to go to that link below because you need to see the whole thing and read, uh, go through the, the, you know, the behind the scenes and look at what this thing was all about. This is a, a thing that was decades in production. Yeah. And, thir- 13 years in production. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, well, you know what they say, right. It, uh, everything good is worth waiting for. So, yep, right. uh, so you did it. Um, so, uh, folks, what I'm going to do is, uh, we've got all the links to, um, uh, all of Tom Gordon's work in the footer. If you go to accesskevin.com where I have this archived, you can see his social links. You can see past productions, which are incredible, man. You know, we talked a little bit about some of these records that you had done, but I just, I got to ask, I mean, like uh, some of these artists that you've worked with in production, uh, dear friend of mine is uh, Nate Morton on The Voice. He's the, the house drummer, you know, for the TV show, The Voice. Um, and and then Paul Murkovich is the musical director yeah, who I worked with on Nelson and oh, with Whitesnake. Really? Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Mur- Murkovich, I mean, all of Murky those bits. guys, I, yeah. I, I, I know all those guys well. And, and actually Paul is somebody that I'd like to have on the show. I, I talked to him yeah. briefly during the pandemic. Um, I was the, the, the runner. I was the assistant engineer on that project. So he doesn't really? probably know me as a, as a producer or an engineer. He was oh like, I God. was the kid. Yeah. I, uh, 
I, I admire what he's been able to do too, because as, in terms of like wrangling cats, right? He, oh, geez. he's he's he's, uh, he's geez. the king of it. But yeah, Nate, he really is. He really is. He's amazing. Nate was just talking to me about uh, working, you know, tracking the new Taylor Swift record. Oh, that all of good. Paul's band I and mean, they all went in and did the new record. And I said, so what was Taylor like to work with? And he said, are you kidding me? Like nobody in the band ever met Taylor. You know, we all did our parts and she <laughs> she never comes in to meet the band. So oh, I was wow. gonna, I was going to ask you like some of the artists that you've worked with in the past. You know, um, do you get like rough tracks and you got to remix and remaster? Or like how is it like guy like working with Dre? Right, working so, the chronic. Yeah, Dre. Dre. You know, a lot of these things. I was the second engineer as they came into town, and then I got involved with them as they went. So every time Dre came back to town, I was brought in to help okay. even though there was another engineer of theirs from la this fabulous guy named richard Huerdia, aka seagal whenever you work with dr dre you're assigned a nickname okay that and and he looked like steven seagal so he got nicknamed seagal okay back then i had hair down to here i saw I some hair, pictures been, online yeah, yeah. With the long hair and uh howard stern had just released private parts so oh. he saw me and said you're stern oh so in, the, in the hip-hop world i'm stern <laughs> nice and, that... yeah yeah God. so it's just how tech support for whatever Dre needed or what Seagal needed. But I ended up, ended up in, in, inadvertently inspiring Dre. Uh, I'll try to make this story short, but it's this is kind of a story I'm known for. I also, I, I do the character Michael Myers from the Halloween movies very well. And I've been really? doing it since, you know, the mid eighties when the, you could first get one of the Myers masks. And a friend of mine, from black potato records referred me to rob zombies management when rob was doing the reboot of ha halloween films oh yeah yeah so i got I, I actually got to submit a package to rob zombie to potentially play uh michael myers in the, the 2007 reboot didn't get the gig but that's what, but it gives you an idea just how serious i am about it yeah so uh so we're working on chronic 2000 in 1999 in reno at, at granny's house and uh, it's late October and I asked the co-producer, this guy named Melman, who had worked, uh, uh, on most of the album, if they were a fan of horror films and, and Melman's like, oh yes, yeah, Stern, we love horror films. I'm like, well, you like the Halloween franchise? And they're like, oh yeah, Michael Myers, that stuff's scary. Uh, can I, can I drop foul language here if I'm quoting or oh, yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. That shit's scary, Stern. I'm like, okay, well, I may have a surprise for you. And they're like, well, what's that? I go, you'll know. You'll, you'll know. <laughs> and, you know, every time Dre came to Reno, it was a large entourage. It yeah. was All right. It was him and like 15 other people with writers, beat makers, singers, musicians. Mike, I think it's Mike Balapons, who now produces Christine Aguilera, was his bass player okay. who came to town. Um, and this is all in 99, so it's still on tape. This is yeah, before right. he was using Pro Tools. Two-inch tape. Two-inch tape, yep. Yeah. And uh, management, security, and his bodyguard was also his chef. Uh, this really? great, awesome guy named Sarge who looked like Lewis Gossett Jr. <laughs> and um, so two days for Halloween, I show up with the Myers costume and I, I at, at Granny's house slash Sierra Sonics recording studio. And I, uh, <laughs> I I go to Sarge, who's making dinner in the kitchen. I'm like, OK, Sarge, it's just me. All right. No guns. All right. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, Stern, go have some fun. I'm like. Right on, Sarge. So they were just cutting a vocal in the tracking room, which is massive tracking room with these baffles around a, a, a Sony microphone. And then everyone else could, all 15 people can fit in the control room. It's that big. Wow. With a giant 72 channel SSL. And Dre is a fabulous engineer. Right. And he was putting together a rough mix of the song they had just cut this vocal on. And the tracking room barely had any light on. And all these baffles everywhere. So I put on the Myers costume. I walk out into the tracking room and I stand half obscured no. behind baffles and I wait five minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> so no. Dr. Dre is putting together this rough mix and I'm at this like 30 degree angle to the room. So I can only see him and two other people who are not paying attention. And after about five minutes of Dre pushing faders, he looks up and says, that's Michael Myers and turns around to the people behind him. And while he turned around, I ducked out. Oh man. So when he turned back around, I was gone <laughs> and I started walking down the hallway and I could hear this murmuring in the control room, this flutter. And I'm like, Oh, this is going to be good. And so since, since I'm six, eight and due to my long wingspan, I was able oh. to open this giant lead studio oh. door by its, by itself. So to, to them, it just looked like it just opened by itself. The place fell silent. 
and I counted to three, and then I right faced into the room, and it oh, exploded. <laughs> half of them laughing their heads off, half, half of them bolting. screaming. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> You're lucky to be alive right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, tell yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so Mel, oh. I mean, uh, Mike, the bass player who now produces Christina Aguilera, is like not into it <laughs> he's yeah. like screams so like a little girl he's like starts running away between <laughs> the <laughs> island of outboard gear and a sofa full of people throws oh. his bass off fortunately the guitar player grabs the bass so i'm like good that's an expensive bass oh my god and mike is just beelining away from me through through these people on the sofa so i do the logical thing i chase him and i'm <laughs> i'm doing i'm doing the myers walk t- totally gaining on him and he's like th- trying to get through all these people like running through molasses and then he gets to all the rental gear all the keyboards and all the uh the the the, the, the synths and the turntables and all the crates of vinyl and he doesn't want to knock anything over but he's in a real hurry yeah and uh, yeah. gets through all that and then finally, there's a straightaway between the island of outboard gear and the console. And he starts sprinting out the door as I'm making that turn. Dre stands up and is observing this whole thing transpire behind him, right? Yeah. So I, I stand, he's standing up. And right when Mike gets to the door, I right face Dre, like oh. we're this close. Oh, man. And, and he's looking at my sternum, right? <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm taller than him, but he's 10 times wider than me. And uh, he says, these words I will take to the grave. He looked at me and said, ah, oh, shit, Stern. The face, <laughs> walk oh, out. Oh, that's it. I never break oh. character unless there are police involved. So yeah. I walk out. I take the costume off in the bathroom. I go find Mike and I apologize. I go tell <laughs> Sarge, who was in the kitchen the whole time, he missed the whole thing what he missed and he was bummed he was like oh i should have gone in there <laughs> yeah Damn it. it had to be on video it has no, to be. not it's yep. not filmed uh so then God. i walk back into the control room and standing ovation you know everyone's yeah. like oh. turn that shit was crazy <laughs> and mailman was like that that wasn't scary during parking lot fools with guns in the parking lot skip sailor that shit's scary i'm like yeah. well, okay whatever fine 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 <laughs> But they started writing this beat that had the Halloween theme in it. The John oh, Carpenter. Yes, yeah. Uh, the Gaga, go, Gaga, go, Gaga, go, Gaga, right. Gaga, which is originally in 5 4. Right. So you can't really rap to 5 4 that well. Oh, I'm yeah. sure there are people who do it, but yeah. um, they swung it so it could be in 4 4. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's cool. That's I'm... fun. But we had worked on over 50 songs uh, for Chronic, or 40 songs. Really? Every time they came to Reno, there was 50 reels of two inch that had to be shipped wow. back and forth. And uh, so I thought it was just going to be one of these tracks. One of the songs we ended up, ended up being sold to Ice Cube and was used on an Ice Cube record. So I have a gold record for Ice Cube and I never met the guy. I, but, I, uh, you never did because you actually did a record with them, right? Uh, not Cube. Oh, no, okay. it was just one of the songs we did for Drake was sold to Cube. Gotcha. Okay. And, and the credits transferred, which was super kind of That them. is awesome. That was War and Peace, but, right? Yeah. War and Peace. Exactly. Yeah, and, right on. Uh, so then when uh, the album came out a year later, I, uh, you know, went, got a copy and, um, I listened to it and tr- sure enough, uh, tr- I think it's track 14 or 15 murder Inc wow. is I-, I inspired murder Inc. That's my contribution to pop culture. I love it, man. <laughs> you, you'll, there's gotta be a Wikipedia page just dedicated to that, right? Yeah. 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 I, and, and, yeah it's, it's, so, yeah, there are, there are some other weird stories but you know, I, i'm happy to announce dre is a sweetheart and oh yeah he was the first person to remember to get me a plaque really yep so wow, i have nothing man. but love for 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 dr dre you know i um everything that i've read about him too i mean i, I am a big eminem fan of course and he certainly was the uh the guy that discovered eminem and, and helped yep. sort of you know get his his start i uh, met him before he became eminem Oh, and he's Marshall, huh? Yeah, he was like he, he came to Reno to do his uh, his part on it's the DRE, and he's like, "This is our new artist, Marshall wow. Eminem. He, he's going to come out in six months and blow up." And we're like, "Okay, hey, good, good, good luck, congratulations." Sure. Yeah, and he was right. <laughs> you know, uh, that's just crazy. You know, when you think about those things, because you know, of course, they've got Eight Mile, right? And it talks about his his history, but did he show up as this toughened, uh, you know, like kid from you know? In like it's just tough Detroit, or did he show up kind of as a, a protege of Dre and and kind of wide eyed, you know, 
hip hop artist? Or what was the what was the energy that he well, brought? You know, with him? I I actually didn't get to spend a lot of time with him. Uh, that was after I had actually already left my my employee there, and I was brought back as a freelancer to do setups and stuff. Okay, uh, on when the time that uh, Eminem was there, so I basically I was introduced to him. And, okay. and he, and he was super polite and, uh, and you know, he was, he seemed genuinely appreciative of what, what was, uh, what he was around with. And it was just a fraction of what was coming. Yeah. Wow, man. I love those kind of stories, you know, really the, those, the feel good stories when stuff works out, you know, and, and, uh, I'm a big fan of somebody that is maybe discovered and introduced to the industry, but appreciates everything, you know, for that they've been, you know, provided instead of getting a little heady and and kind of forgetting where they came from yeah know? yeah right but, right right uh you know i have a feeling had we three more hours we could just talk to neil <laughs> Peart. you know that's the thing that's I, uh, correct but, um i'm in reno fairly often right okay so we, we do gigs there once uh probably once a year but uh um, I've never seen you guys at Del Mar Station a long time ago. When did you start playing with them? Well, I was with Animotion for 16 years before oh. uh, Flock of Seagulls, so I was probably there then. Um, okay. I've been with yep. Flock. I've been with Flock just uh, on my seventh year now. So seventh year, okay. But uh, we did we did just play Sparks during just at the beginning of the pandemic, and then we were in Reno just uh, a couple of times before that. Usually casino gigs, of course. Yep. You know. Yep. That's what um, we do here. But uh, you're right. And we're in Vegas every year, of course, you know, a couple of times a year. But I, it's a, it's a ways out. We're a lot closer to San Francisco for you, right? So, yeah, right, uh, right, right. Got a mountain winery up in uh, Saratoga. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Love it. And we've done the Bill Graham Civic quite a bit in San Francisco, which I love. Um, but I was only bringing that up because if we come through Reno, I would love to sit down with you in that studio and yeah. actually just do a side by side because. Uh, just getting to see you do your your work, you know, where your crafting is uh, is done, would be really fun. And um, just your personality, man. I mean, Kenny Davis was absolutely right. You've got a, a real passion for what you do. And, and I'm glad really... the check cleared. That's good. Oh, enjoy <laughs> it, Kenny. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, well, uh, you know, he has uh, he has good people in his camp. Yeah, and I, yeah, yeah. I do yeah. so appreciate this. So. Um, what I'll do, man, is I will thank you so much for this time. And then I'm going to send people off to see a little bit of battle scar and yeah. then, uh, guys go check out battlescar.inspired-amateur.com and, uh, and see this incredible production he's done. The song I believe is out there on all the streaming platforms too. It right? is. You can get it in Apple iTunes and you can get Apple music and, and, uh, all the Spotify's. Spotify. Yeah. All the Spotify, all the Spotify, but just so, cause I'm not, not a lot of people understand the business end of this. And I'm also a recording arts professor at the university of Nevada, Reno. Okay. And, and so I teach recording arts classes at three different levels and my advanced class is music industry as well. Sure. And, and why I'm doing this project and hiring the people I'm hiring so I can learn more about doing independent release professionally. And all of this is becoming lecture notes for really? my music industry class. So it's also benefiting my students directly. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the issue with streaming is yeah. so, oh, okay. I'll put it on my Spotify feed. I'll put it on my Apple music. Um, that it's, that makes barely no money. It's a fraction of a cent right. with every stream. So right. if you're not a songwriter, uh, with streaming, uh, if you get a million streams as a non-songwriter, it's 80 bucks. Wow. Incredible. And that, uh, yeah. And we, uh, that doesn't help us a ton. If you're a songwriter, it's a much bigger chunk. But so, not yay. enough even then. Yeah. So, um, it was funny. The causes were asking, so how much do you think this is going to raise? And I'm like, I, you can't predict that. Sure. And it won't be from sales. Yeah. Uh, cause the way you make the most money, uh, with sales is if you actually buy the song streaming right. doesn't help us it, when you buy the song it does um and i have some people pressuring me to make vinyl make a 12 inch single of it oh yeah but there's such a backlog on vinyl now it'll be a year before it's done. sure and production uh, costs for vinyl are expensive too exactly yeah. exactly so yeah. don't direct donations and that's what's on the website and that's what's been working so we've okay. we've raised a couple grand so far and 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 i just split it down the middle it's a and they both use it to to do what they need to do and it's all been from private donations. I haven't even seen the first quarter receipts from from uh, um, CD Baby, who did our distribution. Another Oregon company, right? I'll That's right. You know. Yeah, Derek um, Stevers started that one many years yep, ago. Yeah, absolutely. He's... I've been using them for for many years, and uh, yeah, I, I'm sure the number will be laughable when I see it, just because 
yeah. streaming is such a, is such highway robbery. It's true. I so that's what I tell you guys. If you're going to be out there, um, please go to the iTunes or the downloadable uh, places that you can actually purchase this track. And uh, yeah. if you want to make a direct donation, let's make a difference in this cause, man. Music yeah. education yeah. is so so important. It's not just for the appreciation of music, but these kids can discover. Uh, worth and value and it's a, yeah. it's shown scientifically you know to help with other brand development and on the other respect too you know to be able to help further this cause for the oppression of native american you know so let's get uh let's get the money out and help folks out tom gordon i'm really impressed with your <laughs> contributions man i really am i thank I, you it's it's fun to talk to somebody else who really enjoys what you do you know and and as the adage goes, right? If you enjoy what you do, then you never work a day in your life. Exactly. If, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you guys heard this. I mean, you guys, I've heard me say it many, many times, um, you know, get out there and support your local artists. I've talked about Music Millennium. And so that, 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 that. Yes, man, for sure. Get out there and, and buy this music and support these organizations. I've had tremendous support from the local companies here at Music Millennium, Five Star Guitars, Rhythm Traders. Thank you guys so much for making this happen. And again, yeah, I'm going to give you Thank you, this kind thing. sponsors. Thank you, kind sponsors. If you guys haven't done this and you got here late, please go to that link below, youtube.com slash all access live with Kevin Rankin. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell, and you'll be notified about my upcoming guests. And then like this video and go back through the archives and take it a look. It looks like this. It looks like a thumb. That does. <laughs> well placed, my friend. I've got this uh, double jointed thumb here that just bends so far back that it, it like they won't make an emoji out of that, you know? So Well, but, does that help for your 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 batch grip? Not at all, but it makes oh. it hard for me to think of the hitchhike too. So I, yeah. Well, that's too bad. Oh geez. Yeah. Hope you the tour doesn't cancel. That's true, man. <laughs> um so guys. Do me a favor, stick around. I'm going to give you just a taste of what Battle Scar is all about. And then you go to the link below and you get a chance to see the entire video. Thank you to Tom Gordon. Thanks Thank again, you. brother. Thank you, Kenny, for making this happen.